Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. April 2nd, 2023 is both Palm Sunday and Passion Sunday, which means we have a lot of texts. Uh, the first reading is Isaiah 50, verses 4 through 9a. The Psalm is 31, 9 through 16. The Epistle reading or the second reading, Philippians 2, 5 through 11. If you're doing the procession of the palms, that gospel text is Matthew 21, 1 through 11. The gospel reading, 26, four, Matthew 26, 14 through 27, 66. Or you can cut that down to 27, 11 through 54. On our website, we have commentaries on both the longer and the shorter passion reading out of Matthew, authored by different people. And if you are a Palm Sunday enthusiast or traditionalist, we have plenty of old commentaries on the website. One of those is linked if you go to Jennifer Benjamin Brooks's gospel commentary, you can find the 2019 procession of Palms commentary by Greg Carey. Uh, scripture index, there are so many tools at your at your fingertips. A plethora. Or if you are like me, a sermon writing procrastinator, you can spend days <laughs> just collecting ideas that someday will get squeezed into a sermon late Saturday night. Anyway, we are, are privileging passion Sunday as opposed to Palm Sunday, but of course those connect uh, in various ways. But at least we're going to talk about Matthew's passion story, which like all the passion narratives is lengthy and full of uh, details that are both familiar and surprisingly brand new to some people who don't always pay attention or don't always notice what makes one gospel distinctive. So, so much to cover. Maybe we should, we do this frequently, kind of talk about where this year, given your view, your place in the world in 2023, what what captures your attention in Matthew's account that you think preachers might want to uh, linger over? Don't make me call you by name. Well, I'll start. I am drawn this year. I was drawn to verse 51, which is uh, there's a unique detail there in verse 51 to Matthew. So as you mentioned, Matt, about each of the passion narratives. And of course, we'll get the passion narrative according to John on Good Friday, but paying attention to the uniqueness of each of the passion descriptions, I think is always a helpful homiletical technique because there's so much <laughs> and, uh, and, and a lot of people are doing different things. Like they're doing a reading of the, of the, of the passion story. And, and it might not, be, and it might be that your, your sermon is more just like little comments on throughout or who knows. Anyway, I am, I, I was immediately drawn to this detail. The earth shook and the rocks were split as a way to part of that is just the just the literalness of the earth shaking um given the you know the devastating earthquake in in turkey and syria uh and uh having grown up actually with the earth shaking frequently in the bay area of california and earthquake drills but not 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 so much that as uh again uh and and I'm hoping that our readers, our, our watchers, and our listeners will uh, be grace filled with me as how uh, frequently I'm talking about my um, father's death. Uh, but I I was so drawn to that because that's how death feels. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, how do you describe death, or how do you? And, and I've been talking with a, a number of people about this, but one, um, one friend in particular helped me 
think about grief as personified, that grief is not an abstract, but the way in which really like you, f- you feel it, of course, but how it just shows up and, and like intrudes into your life when you're, and, and says to you, okay, this is what we're doing today. You wanted to get this done. No, we're going to stay under the weighted blanket all day and, and take a nap. Uh, and, but that's how, that's what I was drawn to that the earth shook and the rocks were split. That that's what death feels like or, and watching someone die and experiencing that at the death of someone in your life, like your whole earth has it, your whole foundation has shaken underneath you. And, and, and to say unstable is like an understatement. Like you feel everything you can, you have no more, you don't have a foundation. You don't have a landing. You don't know where to put your feet Mm -hmm. and that the rocks were split open, that Mm -hmm. the way in which it death, um, that, that death really just shatters everything that was solid and everything that was, uh, that you thought was stable and it, uh, and that's what it does. And I think I, and, and the, and that's what death does. But, but then you think of the realities of what Jesus death in terms of the earth shaken and the rock split and the way in which, uh, the crucifixion is of of uh, of course connected to our theologies about salvation and and so on and so forth, but the way in which it's an indictment of empire and so that the whole world is shaking because of this death and so that's where I would land yeah. i I know we're supposed to be doing our own, but as you were just talking about that, Caroline, it was also the 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 beginning of that where the curtain of the temple was torn in two and and the words of jesus um where you know that foreshadow this is you destroy this temple and in three days uh, uh i'll build it back the the reality of all our ideologies all of the empires we've constructed all of the institutions we've constructed are um are collapsed when we listen to the voice of the shepherd when we place our faith in what god's intention for the world is and it 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 is completely uh a disruption of all the things that are foundational um I, as you were sharing uh, I was thinking of uh, a text that I shared with you when your mom died, which was one that someone shared with me when my mom died by Megan Abbott, that says, no matter what age you are, uh, when your mom dies, um, it's um, it's like your world spins out of control because you've lost your North Star. And what Jesus death and resurrection and revelation of who God is and what God is doing in the world. It is spinning everything we've tried to control out of control because it's not in our hands. We have to trust God. Um, that, thank you for lifting that verse up. That, 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 that really spoke to me. It's a seismic literally yeah. is the Greek. <laughs> it's a yeah. seismic uh, reality. Really? It just, yeah. 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 How about you, Matt? Where are you dropping in this year? Well, two places, you know, I think, I think in Matthew's gospel, Pilate is particularly sinister. Uh, um, and and clever as can be in terms of how he tries to evade responsibility here, but really is controlling everything and is just uh, a horrible person in this. Uh, uh, Greg Carey, you know, has this line, Passion Sunday asks that we pause to witness an atrocity. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a really good way of, of putting it. So I never want to forget that the way that aspects of Jesus death are utterly ordinary in the sense of familiar. This is the kind of death that we see society tells us to see as collateral damage, right? This is the price of progress. There's going to be quote unquote, little people or annoyances who have to be snuffed out 
for the sake of whatever and uh or people who just die and are never remembered i mean it all it's just if nothing else we pause and we bear witness to that and our own complicity in it and matthew's really just so stark <laughs> that i think there's nothing beautiful that happens here the text, the verses that I'm drawn to this year, though, interestingly, are right next to the ones that you highlighted, which are verses 52 and 53 of chapter 27, where uh, where people come out of their tombs, <laughs> which I'm going to be honest, I always thought was like this, the dumbest detail in Matthew's gospel. I'm like, okay, this is where he goes a little too far. Nobody else mentions this. There's no way something like this could have happened and it not show up in another text or memory. You know, I just kind of always thought like, this is where Matthew gets a little too clever or something like that. I was really helped by um, uh, Matthew Thiessen, a New Testament scholar, has a book called Jesus and the Forces of Death that talks about defilement and, and Jesus. And he's helped me with this text that because in dying, Jesus takes on the ultimate defilement. Nothing defiles like a corpse mm. in 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 Torah. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a rabbi friend, uh, hi Brad, if you're listening, uh, who talks about death being the thing that breaks the image of God in a human being. All right, we're all created in God's image, and but in death, God can't be there. Mm -hmm. So for Jesus to die, let alone to die in such an ugly, humiliating, you know, gross, defiling, unpleasant way and to make the claim that Jesus is Lord, Jesus is God, is to say that God now somehow marches into the heart of a defiling force in the universe, mm -hmm. not to beat it, but to take it upon God's own self and therefore to rob it of its power to defile. And so that's why now all of a sudden these people have come back to life. This is still pre-resurrection. This is right. Jesus' resurrection. This is still pre, this is a different kind of thing but somehow death has lost its power. So if you're in the city and you see this, <laughs> this corpse or whatever it is walking around or somebody you thought was dead, right? This is a, this is supposed to be a walking piece of defilement in Jewish understanding, let alone all the other amazing things that's going on. Mm -hmm. But the implication here is no, death can't even separate you now from God. And so, that might be more of an Easter sermon than a Passion Sunday sermon, I recognize, but it gets to the question of who dies on that cross and what do onlookers think when they see it besides, oh, poor guy, or oh, this is terrible, or I hate our government, or whatever it is. They also see, we thought he was somehow in touch with God, but he's he's a dead, stinking, defiling corpse like anybody else. you know. And, and Matthew's saying, no, not quite. You don't know the full story there. So that's that's a lot of raw material without a whole lot of homiletical flourish, but that's where I'm at this year. A couple of couple of links that I thought about. You you said, you know, that might be more of, of something to bring out on Easter. Um if you're preaching when you when you have the opportunity to preach Hebrews eleven, it's also a demonstration that it Jesus work is eternal work. It's for those who died before they saw the promise, as well as those of us who died after the testimony of the promise. And 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 so there there's there's another place to to link that. Um, and the the thing that I also note on on that verse is the fact that the response to that was to recognize that Jesus truly is the Son of God. Uh, that, 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 you know, if the power of that becomes the proof. Um, so, yeah, I, um, I, in, in terms of dropping in on a text, um, I'm, I, I confess, I don't know if I've said this on air yet, uh, that, uh, I've, I've been watching The Chosen and, um, I, um, appreciated the introduction to Pilate. Uh, and it it gave me a different perspective on Pilate. And I'm not going to give anything away for those who haven't seen it, but just say it it, it caused me to go, ah, oh, hadn't thought about Pilate like that. Um, but I appreciate um, the complicity of, you know, yeah, you have the power to do something and yet 
you try to, you know, clear yourself and you're actu actually not using your voice. You're not using your authority. You're not doing what you've been empowered to do. And then that verse that's right behind that, um, where the people's response is, his blood be on us and on our children. And what that made me think of, and this is something I don't usually do with text because this is going to take it out of the narrative and put it into kind of an ethical principle. Um, but it's watch your words because they curse themselves with that. His blood be on us and on our children. And as often as we try to get folks not to read these texts in an, in an anti-Semitic way, um, here's the setup for it. And um, just as Pilate didn't utilize the authority he had to um, at least pause what was eventually going to happen, the death of Jesus, um, when we participate, to, bleh, bleh, bah, let me try that again. When we participate in casting the blood of Jesus' death on the descendants of these ancient Jews, we're not using our authority and a capacity to do what Jesus' death and resurrection is actually all about. And that is to restore to community those who have done the worst of things. And so there's no place for anti-Semitism -Semit in this because in that we're being like Pilate. We're not using the authority we have in the love of God to say, your ancestors may have said it where you are cursed, but in Christ, I'm going to offer you the life that he offers uh, through his death, resurrection, and promised return. Do we want to, I was thinking like with the other passages, I mean, you can, you know, you can preach on them, but I, I guess I'm leaning toward how some of these other, uh, these other texts might help me to preach the sermon that I talked about of landing on, mm -hmm. on that particular verse of of the earth shook and the rocks were split. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I guess uh, if I had to choose, which I don't have to, but I am going to, I'm going to choose Psalm 31 as my as my conversation partner in this. Uh, and, and particularly Psalm, uh, the 31 verse 15, my times are in your hand. And that's, mm -hmm. that's something that that connects with me in terms of the experience of the the earth shaking and the rock splitting and the way in which uh, these are times that you don't want and don't choose and resist <laughs> uh, it, it, with all of your will, uh, but the promise that my times are in your hand, uh, these times and the times to come, that's where I would I would put my my uh, my idea and the passages that are before us in conversation. Mine would be uh, based on the text that I was focusing on in terms of how do we treat those that um, we think we have permission to dismiss would be Isaiah and just a recognition. Another passage where um, Isaiah is describing Jesus uh, and um, recognizing that, you know, this um um, jumping out of John to Matthew and the beatitude, you know, uh, uh, the instruction, uh, the, it's not a beatitude. I, I got my verses wrong. Um, give me my right zip code, um, turning the other cheek. Um, uh, that is in Matthew, but it, it's not a beatitude. Um, but um, but that, that this wasn't a brand new idea that Jesus came up with, but that this is actually uh, what uh, Isaiah describes as the, the expectation. And so we have this authority, we have this capacity to not be like everybody else. And that is um, to not be rebellious, to not be against those that our, our society allows us to marginalize, um, to, to not turn backward. Um, 
and uh, sometimes that means turning the other cheek. Um, so um, I, I would I would work that in if I were playing with that. You know, how do I not let this generation live into the curses that their four parents may have set up? Yeah. For me, it's Psalm thirty one. Probably the you know this is such a it, it speaks such despair. But there's a particular line in verse 12, I have passed out of mind like one who is dead. Mm. Uh, I have become like a broken vessel. A lot of the Old Testament um, imagination around death is to have been forgotten. Like, how will one be remembered? Mm -hmm. This is why children are so important in a lot of the Old Testament memories. Mm -hmm. This is uh, the idea of having a name or having something that carries on that out that will outlive you and why it's important to be buried for example in in old testament stories that the worst thing that can happen to one who's dead is to become forgotten to like mm. pass away and that notion of being cut off is so significant which i think if i'm going to go back to my text there at the end of, of matthew 27 and this idea of these these bodies to come back to life and then as soon as jesus is raised they you know, go out in the streets but this idea that it's not just a defilement thing that those people are not forgotten not cut off to go back we, we read ezekiel a week ago and and the trauma one of the traumas in that text is we're cut off we're utterly cut off from mm -hmm. our home from our god from our identity from our past and so how is death no longer um, a separation or how does the death of Christ utterly paradoxically <laughs> a death we'd like to forget and do a lot to put out of our mind or do a lot to sanitize? How does that death nevertheless not, um, uh, does, how does, how does somehow in Christ's death, we do not pass away from God's sight. We do not get cut off from, from that remembrance. So. Not that we can explain it, but I think we believe that it, it happens. Maybe we should say that as as our as our listeners are preparing for Passion Sunday slash Palm Sunday, it's a very busy week after probably a very busy Lent, and you have a lot of, of prep to do, a lot of preaching to do, and I think I speak for all of us when I say it's an honor to be part of your preparations, and we pray God's blessings on you and your health and your creativity during the week to come. 